Good afternoon on this uh, day of spring when it's supposed to snow or not. Unclear. Uh, we, we feel like it's uh, not snowing out of respect for our speaker, so it's, uh, that bodes very well. Um, uh, for those I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health here, and welcome to our uh, monthly public health forums. These public health fora really are intended for us to um, have uh, conversations with experts about uh, challenging topics, about topics that uh, that matter to the health of the public. And today, we're actually talking about something that has been very much in the media for a while, which is on the notion of uh, pricing of pharmaceuticals and the challenges that poses for um, uh, us as a as a community interested in the health of the public. Before I introduce the speaker, I just want to acknowledge uh, that um, a lot of the work for this was done by the pharmaceutical certificate, which until recently was led by uh, Aaron Luca, who's here today and now taken over by Dr. Veronica Ward. So thank you, both of you. Um, we have a terrific speaker for us today, and um, I think really uh, one of the people who is uh, perhaps best suited to talk about this topic, uh, Dan Allendorf. Uh, so Dan Allendorf, very briefly, is a chief scientific officer of ICER, which Actually, I can see it, you can see it, Institute for Clinical and Economic Review uh, since 2007. And uh, in this role, he is responsible for essentially the reviews of uh, comparative effectiveness of healthcare technologies, decision analysis, and budgetary impact of new technologies. He has a, a team of scientists at ICER building on his uh, 30 years of healthcare experience working in these issues. Before ICER, he was executive director of the Health Economics and Outcomes Research for IMS Health, and he's also served as vice president of um, applied research at uh, Farm Metrics, which is now uh, IMS. He has uh, written extensively in uh, major journals, on, is on the editorial board of Journal of Managed Care Pharmacy, and uh, serves on a number of national and international organizations. He um, has a PhD from University of Amsterdam, but everything he knows, he learned in an MPH here from the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, um, Amsterdam was just uh, icing on the cake. Uh, so it's really uh, a delight to have uh, a speaker who is uh, an expert about an interesting topic, but also one of our own graduates. Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dean Galea. And uh, let me echo my sentiments for a happy spring, everyone, um, even given the, uh, the current environment outside. Uh, I am very happy to be here, very grateful for the invitation, um, and happy to be here as a BU alum, among other things. Um, my wife is also a BU alum and a current BU employee, and she's here as well, so I really have to be on my game. Uh, but let's talk about the wonderful and wacky world of drug pricing. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of things, and I'll go through an outline in a minute. Um, first, the obligatory disclosure side slide. Uh, our project work is supported by grants from a number of foundations, most notably the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, Blue Shield of California Foundation, and the California Healthcare Foundation. We also have a separate membership program which supports a single policy summit that we host every year, as well as a couple of other dialogue opportunities uh, that program is supported by manufacturers and health plans who participate as ICER members. But importantly, we try to keep the project work focused on the foundation funding. That way we can provide everything as a public good. So you'll note that all of our documents and work products are available publicly to anybody who wants to download them. And so we try to keep that firewall in place. So um, just an outline for my talk today. I'll talk a little bit about my organization. I'll set some context for um, what things look like for pricing, uh, most notably in this country. Um, we'll also talk about some methodological underpinnings for value-based pricing. But importantly, we'll also speak to how the international experience with this has kind of driven uh, a lot of the thinking that's currently in play today. We'll talk about this notion of value frameworks. That's kind of a, a very popular buzzword these days and how ICER plays a role in that as well. We'll talk about our experience with reviews of the comparative clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness of new therapeutics. And then I'll also talk about what um, is currently discussed as a component of value-based pricing, but really is not. There are a couple of examples here that we'll go through. Uh, and then there should be plenty of time for questions and answers and other comments um, at the end. Um, but please stay awake because I'm going to ask you a couple of questions as I go through this. So who are we? Uh, we're an independent health technology assessment group with academic roots. So we were started at the Mass General Hospital and affiliated with that other medical school down the street 
for a while. Uh, we spun out in 2013 to become an independent 501c3, so that is our status today. Our role is to develop publicly available assessment reports. Um, we do this on pharmaceuticals, but we also look at devices, procedures, and health system level interventions as well. And importantly, that's really one half of our role. The other half of our role is to convene a public conversation about what we found. So we will talk about how we do this, but we convene regionally based independent appraisal committees to hold public hearings on the topics of interest, um, discuss and deliberate over the evidence, and really involve all stakeholders in that conversation. We have been called the National Drug Cost Watchdog. Um, it's kind of a fun term, so we don't really talk about that in the office, but that's what some in the media call us. And so here's an interesting quote. Uh, we had a reporter from Wired actually spend a day with us. Um, and uh, I'll talk in a little bit about how I think he got this uh, slightly wrong. So this is uh, a couple of pithy turns of phrase, but he's talking about when one party in a deal knows more about the goods than the other, economists call this, refer to this as information asymmetry. And it's a classic recipe for market failure. Anybody who's trying to negotiate anything knows that that's a, a good way to get a bad deal. So our president, Steve Pearson, according to this reporter, has taken it upon himself to fix this information imbalance, generate the missing data, and calculate a fair price for drugs. It's straightforward yet radical work, a missing puzzle piece in the effort to solve our drug pricing crisis. Now, my quibble with this is that we actually know a lot about the goods right? We've got drugs that are approved by the FDA. There may be uncertainties about the long-term durability of benefit or safety issues that might arise after the typical duration of clinical trials, but we have clinical trial data on efficacy. We have information on safety issues. In fact, not just summary information, but detailed information at times. So it's not as though we're missing that kind of information. What is missing is that the strategy for drug pricing seems to have nothing to do with those clinical data. That's the information asymmetry we're talking about. So as I mentioned, we have these three independent appraisal committees. Uh, we started with one in New England, the New England Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council. Um, Austin Fract, who's on the faculty here, is a member of that council. Uh, California Technology Assessment Forum as well, and we also have a CPAC in the Midwest. So um, interestingly, these groups were created when we were focusing primarily on device procedures and health system level interventions, where some regional capacity issues and other leg legislative or other issues on a statewide basis um, were more impactful. Uh, beginning in 2014, we began to pivot more towards a focus on emerging pharmaceutical innovations, and there the policy questions are really national in scope. So, these are still regionally based. Um, the groups um, have been with us for a long time now, and we think they work well. But we're talking primarily about national policy issues at this point. So let's talk about what the current context is in the US for pricing of pharmaceuticals. And we'll talk a little bit about how to think about pricing from a value perspective. So first of all, is there a price problem? So I'm showing a slide from a recent publication um, that's kind of providing an updated level of information on health spending as a percentage of GDP, both in the US and in 10 other high-income countries. And you'll see, if I can get the laser pointer to work, that as a percentage of GDP, we spend two times, up to two times, what other countries spend on GDP. Now, Lots of other public, converse, public health conversations can happen at this point about what we're actually getting for that spending, but I'm not gonna go there right now. Um, this is a slide that's been shown over many years and essentially with the same pattern. And so we've seen this before. Interestingly, the analysis here also looked at healthcare utilization, which is often implicated as a major driver of spending, and found that in fact, the US is not top ranked and a lot of indicators of healthcare utilization. So it's really not utilization that's the reason. Uwe Reinhardt, um, famous late great health economist, was also famous for the quote, 
it's the price is stupid. And that's what it is. So interestingly, in this updated analysis, really for the first time, pharmaceutical spending has been shown to be a key driver of these trends. So, um, and in fact, not just in the US, but in other countries that are ranking higher on the percentage of GDP spent, um, pharmaceutical pricing is a key component of that. So it's a concern. So how did we get here? Now I'm going to really focus back on the US for a bit. So starting at the top, if you kind of go around clockwise here, we've got an innovative pipeline. Um, there is a lot of generic prescribing happening in this country. Um, we were just talking about that in a meeting earlier, 80 to 85 percent of prescriptions written are for generics in the US. We also have a lot of really interesting and innovative therapies coming through the pipeline. We've got a situation where market ex ex exclusivity is guaranteed, so there's a monopoly for branded drugs. That's not just a US issue, but that is something to think about. There are ways for companies to extend patent lives, limit competition, um, that are part of the framework that we operate under today. There's not a lot of information for payers or consumers, individual consumers, to get credible data on effectiveness and value. Um, we do not have a national health technology assessment organization. It's a void that we at ICER are trying to fill, but that does not exist in this country. There's no ability for Medicare to negotiate or regulate prices, and Medicaid agencies are limited by a mandated uh, rebate level with some possible wiggle room for additional rebates, um, but this varies substantially from state to state. And even the large private payers have uh, limited bargaining power because they only capture a slice of the population here. We are not a single payer system. Oftentimes, although some of that is changing, prescribers have been historically disconnected from concerns about costs. They want to focus their conversations on the clinical details with the patient. So there are a lot of challenges for how um, pricing is derived, developed, and considered in negotiation. So what is value-based pricing? The relationship of the price of a good to its value or utility is really nothing new. Uh, in the 18th century, classical health economics or economics in general focused on utility to society or to a distinct societal class that was appropriate for the time, so the economics of Smith or Malthus. The utility to the individu individual has been discussed for many, many years, millennia in fact, dating back to the ancient Greeks. But a formalized school of thought around this was first proposed by Jeremy Bentham in the early 1800s. And a little bit of an aside, we're, we can be very grateful to Jerry ben, Jeremy Bentham's friends and colleagues because he apparently had such uh, a high degree of writer's block and anxiety that he never published any of his work on his own. His colleagues did it for him. So um, thank you to Jeremy's friends. So taking that then basis of value and utility to the individual, um, what about cost effectiveness analysis and how is it applied to healthcare? So this is a very brief tour of a lot of these tenants and happy to answer any questions further. Um, I know that some of your coursework will address this as well. Formalized cost effectiveness analysis was developed in the 1960s to assist primarily with resource allocation in the military, the notion of scarce resources and the need to use some quantitative approach to prioritize what resources made the most sense to spend money on. Milt Weinstein, again at that school down the road, uh, and Stason published a landmark paper in New England Journal applying these techniques to healthcare settings. And I'm going to talk about some of the major tenets of this research, really tenets that exist today, still today as well. So the presentation of a cost effectiveness analysis in health is the ratio of the net costs associated with the introduction of a new intervention relative to whatever it's replacing or competing against um, to the net benefits gained. So most commonly, that ratio is expressed as a cost per quality adjusted life year gained, or quality. Utility weights are used to adjust life expectancy. You could also see cost per life year gained as a calculation. But that quality of life adjustment is typically 
uh, very important, especially in chronic conditions, and so cost per quality gained tends to be the general presentation. There's a notion of discounting future costs and benefits, common to CEA really in any discipline. The notion that benefits accrued and costs incurred downstream are worth less than those incurred today. And because any model, no matter how robust the data that, that inform it, can be subject to uncertainty, recommendations made for a variety of sensitivity analyses done to test some of those assumptions and parameters. Again, this is the basis for how this kind of work still happens. So from a decision-making standpoint, we could think about results of a cost-effectiveness analysis, again, comparing an intervention to its comparator um, in four quadrants. And so if you think about a new intervention that is more costly and less effective than what it might be replacing, it's an easy decision, right? Sorry, more costly, less effective. <laughs> Reject. Um, if you think about an intervention that is less costly and more effective than what it's replacing, that's also an easy answer, adopt. The real possibilities exist in these two quadrants, and this one really, when you're thinking about something new, is not something we come across very often. So this is an intervention that is less costly and less effective than what it's replacing. It's a possibility you want to make a resource decision based on this. Um, but what we are coming across more commonly is this quadrant. So the new intervention is both more expensive and more effective than what it's replacing. And the question is, is the additional expense worth the money in terms of the benefit derived? That's the question the cost effectiveness analysis is trying to answer. So let's take a brief departure to understand whether the average US consumer thinks about value in this way. So talked about the theoretical roots a little bit. We talked about the principled application of methods. So the idea that a reasonable price paid for the value of goods received is what people could think about when they think about value. What does the average consumer in this country think about when they think about value? Who wants to offer a suggestion? What is value to the average consumer? Nobody? What was that? Decrease symptoms. I'm, I'm talking about anything. It doesn't have to be a health intervention. What is, what's a good, what, is pe what do people think of when they think of a good value when they're buying something as a consumer? Low price. Low price. So in surveys of consumers, they talk about something as cheap, budget, discounted, a bargain. It's not necessarily what we're talking about when we're talking about a decision made on a new intervention for a major health condition. We're talking about a reasonable cost for additional value achieved, not something that's cheap. This gets further confused when people think about other issues in healthcare, where oftentimes a substantial percentage of consumers positively correlate price with quality. You know, I could get my gallbladder removed at this community hospital or I could go downtown to the Longwood area and get it removed there. It's more expensive downtown, it must be better. So there are lots, there's a lot of confusion out there among the average consumer, which makes, in fact, trying to convey a lot of the conversations around value that we like to have as policymakers even more difficult. So a brief aside there. From a policymaker standpoint, there are multiple roles that we would see for value assessment, potential roles that value assessment could play. So one is informing transparency legislation. This is kind of a coming wave at the state level where states are trying to hold manufacturers accountable for the prices they charge by trying to understand how those prices were derived. And value assessment could actually be uh, an important comparator or benchmark to that kind of conversation. Innovative payment mechanisms. So a lot of talk about this as well. I'll talk about it a little bit later. But whether that is or is not aligned with the value question is another issue. Negotiation, negotiation and formularies. Clearly, if somebody's interested in creating a value-based formulary, and there have been a couple of pockets of that that have already occurred in the US, this kind of information is critical and public policy development. 
if, for example, um, a society, a state, a government agency wanted to make resource allocation decisions based on this kind of work, this is the kind of work they would do. So there are potential roles for value assessment. Whether all those roles are actually being played right now is another question. So let's talk about whether value has historically driven decisions in healthcare in the US. So the evolution of the science around cost effectiveness led many governments to embrace it as a tool for decision making across disciplines. Medicare actually proposed to do this itself in 1989, and it was a failure. Who wants to tell me why they think it was a failure? Somebody's got to have an idea. Industry was against it. Industry was against it. That was very true, yes. There were concerns about rationing there. This was the original death panel conversation, right? So. It predated Sarah Palin by a number of years, but it was the same sort of thing. It was politically tied to rationing, strong effects of interest groups, including the pharmaceutical industry, a mistrust of the science. Cost effectiveness wasn't really that old a discipline, um, even in 1989, and a pluralistic US health system. So a decision that might be appropriate for a large national commercial payer may not be appropriate for a small regional one. So lots of concerns and questions about this. Looking at Medicare again, in terms of how this has actually played out in practice, uh, Peter Newman did some work to look at a variety of interventions, different modalities of treatment. This is about 10 years ago now. And showing um, some interventions that were actually very cost effective or cost saving with very low usage rates in the Medicare population. Other interventions that are clearly cost ineffective with high rates in the Medicare population. We know lots of potential drivers around this. There are perverse incentives for providers to continue to do procedures that have not shown to be effective or cost effective. Um, and so there are lots of things that happen in our system that are not cost effective. And so value really hasn't driven decision making uh, in the US up until this point. Also, another historical um, analog would be the Office of Technology Assessment. So this was funded in 1972, a US government agency, a very unique model with a governing board that was balanced both politically and with special interest input, really held up as a very strong scientific example of robust methods and approach. Uh, this was an agency that worked across industries, so it was not just focused on healthcare, but others as well died a slow death after questioning the scientific and economic fe feasibility of the Strategic Defense Initiative. Now, I'm old enough to remember what that was, but I'm not sure if, if everyone here is. So what was that? Star Wars. This was a Reagan-era effort to use laser beams or phaser beams or whatever they would be for satellites to, to shoot at enemy satellites. Um, lots of physical and other reasons why this was impractical. And the OTA made the mistake of calling that out. Um, and so that was really its demise. And it was defunded in 1995. So um, some of the methods that the OTA utilized are actually used by other health technology assessment agencies um, now. But in fact, it's not something that's uh, available to us today. So let's pivot then to the international experience. So embedding value in health technology assessment processes. Health technology assessment as a discipline has also been around since the 1960s. So started really after World War II with the work of Archie Cochran to try to um, understand how to apply clinical trial data um, for decision making, how to design good studies, how to use that evidence from studies to understand the robustness of a particular intervention. It's a natural outgrowth of a need for governments to keep pace with technological innovation in health and other disciplines, for that matter. It exists in every developed nation today in the form of a government agency or an independent organization that receives appropriations from the government. Now, um, there are some US-based 
agencies that come close to this approach. Can anybody think of some of those? So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Notably, both of those agencies, either because of fear or because of legislation, do not consider questions of cost or value at all. So they are focused on comparative clinical effectiveness alone. And in fact, the international community was as well for a very long time. But beginning in the 1990s, there was a bit of an evolution in their approach to considering value alongside the clinical data. So this started with the conversion of what had been provincially based individual HTA agencies in Canada to a pan-Canadian effort, which was first called the Canadian Coordinating Center for HTA, has now become the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, or CADETH, which is a mouthful of an acronym. Um, also the creation of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK, uh, expansion of the remit of the Australian Pharmacy Benefits Advisory Committee and Medical Services Advisory Committee, and others. The typical process, and we won't get into all the details here, involves the manufacturer submission, in fact, of a systematic review, evidence synthesis, and an economic model tailored to that country's realities for evaluation by whatever authority is in place, as well as academic consultants who will work with the authority to um, vet and test the model and the analysis. So, these organizations have, have kind of come full circle in looking both at clinical data and questions of value explicitly. And while drugs that receive regulatory approval technically have marketing authorization, they don't get reimbursed in these countries until this HTA agency has made its recommendations. Okay, that's very, a very different environment here, of course. So they also have a variety of thresholds for what they consider good value. In NICE, it's typically 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality gained. That's um, interesting that there's been some empiric work done around the societal willingness to pay for an additional year of quality adjusted life. It's actually lower than this number. Um, but the threshold remains at 20 to 30,000 30, pounds per, qual per quality. And there are some special cases, uh, advanced cancers, ultra rare conditions where those criteria are relaxed a bit, uh, but that's the standard. In other countries, these thresholds vary. So in these three countries, for example, 20,000 to 45,000 euros per quali. There are more dynamic thresholds at play in Canada and Australia and elsewhere. Um, but there is some determination made for what is considered good value. Now, operationalizing this, again, a topic I could talk about for the entire time, but I won't is questions of whether something of good value at the individual level is affordable at the population level. So I'll come back to that when I talk about our own methods a bit. So let's talk about these value frameworks then. Um, the growth in value frameworks, particularly in, particularly in the US, has really come about because even in countries that have more mature health technology assessment, there's a concern with a more narrow focus on cost effectiveness as the primary determinant of value. So patient groups may say that some aspects of the reality of living with disease or the potential benefits of an intervention aren't really easily quantified in an economic model. Industry may say it can't just be about value. There has to be some discussion about what kind of incentives remain for us to keep innovating. Clinicians say, we still don't know how to talk about this stuff with our patients. So there are questions and there's an interest in developing tools to try to broaden the consideration of value. So we've developed our own framework and there are a number of others as well. This is actually is not the full list any longer. Um, but it's notable that many of these frameworks are trying to deal with different aspects of value in different ways. So we've got some frameworks, NCCN, ASCO, the drug abacus, that are solely focused on one clinical area, cancer. Uh, we've also got the ACC and AHA, which are focused on cardiology. So really, the ICER framework is trying to apply a lot of this thinking across clinical conditions, and at this point is the only one to do that. Um, 
Some tools like ASCO's tool are intended to be uh, informative for a patient clinician conversation. Ours is more focused on population-based health decisions. So uh, there are a number of differences, but you'll see that there are, are domains that are common across many of them. So we have to think about clinical benefit and safety. We think about cost effectiveness as one component. Affordability is important in some. Um, other elements, the novelty of a treatment, the rarity of the condition may come into play as well. So what's the framework that underlies our reports? Um, we feel like the goal of our work is to try to inform sustainable access to high value care for everyone who's a candidate for a given intervention. And that's a recognition that every health system has limited resources. So, they, so any health system cannot pay for everything. And so it's important to try to quantify the trade-offs between adopting a new intervention and what interventions it might displace. We think about this from two perspectives. The long-term value for money perspective includes cost effectiveness, but also looks at the clinical benefits that are coming out of the clinical studies, our level of certainty in that evidence, and the magnitude of benefit that's seen. We also have elements around other benefits not easily quantified and contextual considerations around the introduction of a new treatment. I'll give you a list of some of those in a minute, but that's intended to try to provide a contextual wraparound to some of the more quantifiable analysis that we're doing. And then we talk about short-term affordability. This is not really a question of value. This is a question of how to take high-value interventions and introdu introduce them to the system in a way that manages affordability. So not to break the bank, so to speak. So those factors that affect long-term value for money that are more contextual may be around the disease severity or a significant burden of illness or unmet need. It may be around how effective the current standard of care is and whether this represents a big leap over that. Um, is this the next best thing for the next 10 years? Or are there other innovations coming shortly um, that might also change the picture? Um, any other e e ethical, legal, social concerns, disparities, et cetera? Um, maybe there are some things that are intervention specific. So is there reduced complexity or increased complexity associated with the treatment? Um, is there a new mechanism of action? So for example, there are a number of cancers um, with different classes of chemotherapeutic agents that patients develop resistance to. So the introduction of a new method of action essentially allows those patients to keep living. So there are some things that we feel bear discussing again in this public forum with mul multiple stakeholders present. So our value-based price benchmark, which is the range that we consider a fair price, um, again, takes that long-term value for money um, segment of our work, uses the results of our cost-effectiveness analysis, which is presented in draft form, adjusted based on comment received from any stakeholder, um, if we feel that the, that the comment is justified, and then produced in a revised report um, to create this benchmark price range. That price range is $100,000 to $150,000 per quality. So um, again, hearkening back to some of that empiric research, this is pretty generous. There's other work suggesting that the societal willingness to pay in the U.S. for a unit of health gain, an additional quality, um, so to speak, is about $50,000. But there's been work done at the WHO level suggesting that in many developed countries, there is a range between one and three times GDP per capita and so this is about two to three times GDP per capita. Again, we've gotten a lot of comments about how this threshold is too high. We've gotten a lot of other comments about how this threshold is too low. So um, lots of conversations about that. So I'm not sure why this isn't advancing. There we go. For affordability, we're not trying to necessarily say that a price should be adjusted uh, 
to match a particular budget impact threshold because we know that will also vary by payer and system. What we're trying to show is that based on our estimate of the short-term impact, so we use a five-year window to look at budget impact, and the potential size of the candidate population for a new intervention, how many of those patients could be treated without crossing a threshold that we've tied to GDP growth? So we're essentially saying that we don't want the additional spending for a given intervention to outpace growth in the overall economy in the U.S. generally. Exceptions might be made for really groundbreaking innovations, but this is kind of a general rule of thumb to think about as a signal to whether additional affordability measures need to be taken, whether that be prioritizing treatment or um, setting criteria so that um, specialists with particular knowledge of that drug and that condition are the ones prescribing, there are some measures that could be used, outcomes-based payment arrangements, those kinds of things. So we just show in our calculation that at different price points, different percentages of the eligible population could be treated without crossing that threshold. <clears throat> so I'm going to take one quick break to just get a, get a sip of water. So let's talk about what we've found over the past couple of years. Our price is becoming more value-based. So the fir very first analysis we did under this framework was an assessment of the PCSK9 inhibitors for high cholesterol. This was done at a time when the only trials available were based on a surrogate outcome, LDL lowering. There was not information available yet on prevention of MIs, strokes, and um, cardiovascular related mortality. At the time, these drugs were priced at $14,000 a year, which ex exceeded even Wall Street estimates for what they would cost. And we suggested that the discount needed to achieve our value based price range would be anywhere from 50 to 90%. We also found that in most of the situations here, so those percentages in red, there was a suggestion that um, significant reductions from the list price would need to occur before that value-based price would be achieved. And even when we started using available data on net prices, so negotiated prices as opposed to the list price, we also saw that further discounting was probably going to be required. A couple of exceptions here, uh, in Tresto for heart failure, uh, was actually very cost effective at its list price. Um, could have actually gone up in list price and stayed within our range. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later too. And then atopic dermatitis, which I'm going to talk about right now. So for those clinicians in the room, here's the obligatory gross photograph. Um, this is a patient with severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, as it's been described to us, this is a particularly vexing condition. Um, different than psoriasis in this, that this not only features the disfiguring um, and unsightly lesions, but these are also incredibly itchy. So um, patients have insomnia as a result of this and other problems. So a big impact on quality of life. Let's talk first about what everybody expected to happen with this drug. It's the first biologic introduced into this area. So a bunch of topicals have been used without great success. Um, first biologic agent, significant clinician interest in its use, no competitor out there on the near-term horizon. Most Wall Street folks expected the launch price to be about the same as the biologics used in plaque psoriasis, about $60,000 a year. Population pool is very large here, so 350 to 400,000 patients. Anticipated payer reaction, some noise and bother, but grudging acquiescence to the manufacturer price. Some stiff coverage put in place to limit use, um, probably making patients try and fail a bunch of those topicals before they can get to use this. Um, and then either some increase in premium or increase in patient cost sharing to try to recover some of those costs. So if 200,000 of these patients got the drug, this would be one of the biggest drug launches in history, $12 billion a year. What actually happened? Again, some quotes. The company came to us and said, we have a couple of concerns about your model. We want to share those with you. We said, fine. Um, they had some utility data, some actual directly elicited utilities from their clinical trials that they wanted to provide us. 
even though those data hadn't been published yet. And we said, we'll review it. If, it, if we think it matches up to what we would expect, we'll use it. And so we did. And they said, we don't have any more quibbles with your model. So whatever price you come up with, we're going to fall in your range. And that's what they did. So uh, I think the list price ended up at 37000 so much lower than anticipated. They were suggesting they would put in another 20% discount to payers and PBMs to come in at about 31000 So this got a lot of press because this is obviously an unusual activity. Um, the company felt like this was a breakthrough. They wanted to get it to as many patients as possible, and they knew they would have a problem doing that if they came in the way that everybody else typically comes in. So there's a quote from a, a, a chief medical officer at Express Scripts, one of the larger PBMs in the country, um, basically saying it was a successful negotiation. In, in a successful negotiation, nobody gets exactly what they want. Everybody has to compromise somewhere, and that's kind of what happened here. So was that a one-off? Now, unfortunately, the most recent example I can give you is from the same company. <laughs> Makes one of the PCSK9 inhibitors essentially admitted not only to us privately, but also publicly, that they got the pricing wrong. So two and a half, three years ago, they priced this too high. Nobody's using it. Payers are putting really onerous coverage criteria and prior authorization criteria in place. They want people to use it. So they knew that they were doing their outcomes-based trial, so their, a trial that was recently released in tracking MI, stroke, and other hard outcomes. And they were focused on a higher risk subset of the population, so patients who'd had an MI or hospitalization for unstable angina within the prior year. And they also had some subgroup analyses to see whether patients who had that profile and a high LDL would be at greater risk of events and possibly benefit um, in an even greater way from the drug. And that's what, they, that's what they saw in their results. About a day after the blind was broken on the trial, they called us and said, if we give you data, can you run this through your model, show us what a, range, a, a reasonable price range would be, and then we will announce what we're going to do when we release the results at ACC. So um, thanks to my wife, I was able to work all weekend to work with the modeling team to get that done. Um, and, and that is exactly what happened. So we worked with an established model, the CBD policy model, run by UCSF and Columbia to generate those results. Um, again, 14000 a year list price. We came up with a price range that was pretty broad because there were some assumptions about um, the effects on all-cause mortality and competing risks that we had to make at different levels. So it's a pretty broad range, but it's a, su a substantial reduction, obviously, in the price. And the company basically said, we're going to abide by this. They did not agree with everything we did, the assumptions we made. They thought we should have given more of a mortality benefit than we did. But they said, you did this independently. We respect your work. We're going to go with this. What we want payers to do now is loosen those criteria so that the patients who, who meet this definition of a high-risk subset can actually get access to the drug. And so now it remains to be seen what will actually happen with payers, but there's at least some public discussion about possibilities here. Now, there have been other companies and other drugs that have launched their products after one of our reviews. Again, those products have come in below Wall Street expectations, but we're not sure whether that's just because of the increased scrutiny on drug pricing that's generally happening, or if it's because of the work that we did. We didn't really get, didn't have that close a tie as we have with this manufacturer. So let's talk about what value-based pricing is not or what is not value-based pricing. Who's heard the term value-based insurance design, or VBID? Okay. Developed by Mark Fendrick, the University of Michigan, a good guy, friend of mine. Um, but it's not really what we're talking about here. The idea is that you would reduce or eliminate patient cost sharing for therapies deemed to be of high value. Makes a lot of sense, right? You want people to get access, you want to eliminate those financial barriers. It's a darling of Congress. Um, CMS has it as a demonstration project. I think it's now available as an alternative design for Medicare Advantage plans. But high value in this approach is defined only in clinical terms. So you could have a clinically 
high value intervention that is vastly overpriced be covered here? And there's really no clear link to how the payer is going to recover those costs by eliminating cost sharing. So there's no um, analog to eliminate low value services to pay for these higher value services, for example. And it's currently only focused on prescription drugs. We know there are high value services that are not prescription drugs that could be part of this but currently aren't. So this is not quite value based in the way we're talking about value based pricing. What about value-based contracting? So here's a, a headline from a recent article. This is the other PCSK9. They had an outcomes trial release results about a year ago, which were not as impressive as the results from the, the other drug, and also not even as impressive as their LDL lowering results were. So they said, you know what? We're going to put our money where our mouth is. They basically signed an agreement with Harvard Pilgrim, in fact, to say, if a patient on our drug has a heart attack or stroke, we're going to provide a full refund. OK, so this is a room that has a fair number of epidemiologists and clinicians in the room, right? 100 patients get their drug at $14,000 a year. Let's say it's a secondary prevention cohort. So these patients have already had an event in their past. How many of those 100 patients are going to have an MI or stroke in the next year? Three, four, right? That's not a big discount when you talk about it at the population level, right? So this is good PR, but this is not value-based contracting. It doesn't really, on its own, serve to bring that price and the benefit to the patient into alignment with each other. It can be used in some cases to cement a value proposition. So I showed you the results for Entresto, the heart failure drug, which showed up to be very cost effective, not only in our evaluation, but in others. That's also had trouble gaining a foothold in the market because its competitors are largely generic and payers, quite honestly, are being, pre being pretty myopic about this. So they've actually used outcomes-based contracts to say if a patient's hospitalized for heart failure, there will be a refund or a further discount to try to increase market share. That makes sense. Can't be used as a substitute when that price is out of alignment. Really can't. They're also very difficult to implement, these agreements, because it requires the payer to do some logistics to track utilization and outcomes um, to be able to manage this kind of thing. And I think outcomes-based contracting is probably a better descriptor for it because of that concern. So let's summarize briefly. I think I've got a few more minutes for questions and answers. So is value-based pricing a panacea, a building block, or a pipe dream? It's not going to solve everything. Okay? We have a health system that has lots of waste in all different aspects of it. Some of it relates to value. Some of it relates to other sets of incentives. And even systems that have value-based approaches that have been generally accepted by the public there are special cases that always, they always struggle with. So I mentioned cancer, for example. In the UK, there are drugs that are not recommended by NICE because their price is out of alignment with benefit. They're still prescribed to patients through something called the Cancer Drugs Fund because it's a political conversation. Um, there's a lot of societal dread about cancer. That's the way it is. And so they've had to make some accommodations for it. Other situations, like very rare disorders, to really reward manufacturers for those incentives, if a, if a standard cost effectiveness threshold is applied, those tend to come in at a higher price point because those research and development costs per patient for very rare disorders are pretty high. That means that if using a standard cost effectiveness approach, nothing would ever be recommended. So special cases deserve special consideration at times, but it's a struggle because at the same time, if you make a decision for a special case, you're removing an option for somebody who's not considered a special case. So I think our view is that in the US, after a long, long time, talking about value-based pricing and implementing it in certain circumstances is a start. One of the things that we talked about earlier today that everybody needs to think about, though, is that 
we don't have government support for this kind of thing. This is a private sector enterprise right now. And that means that manufacturers who are thinking about value-based pricing and applying it in their own decisions are pitting themselves against their own shareholders. So my boss actually participated in an investor call with Sanofi and Regeneron after they made this announcement. And there were people from Deutsche Bank and Goldman Sachs screaming at the CEO saying, you've given up all of your leverage. You know, your pricing power is gone because you're deciding to take what another group says and adopt it in your own decision making. And the CEO's response was, that's the reality. This is the reality. We have to do something about this because the current system as we have it is unsustainable. So those kinds of struggles are going on. And I'll close with a quote from George Merck, the chairman of Merck and Company in the, about the middle of the 20th century. So he was famous for refusing to meet with his own shareholders, in fact. And he said, we never try, we never, try never to forget that medicine is for the people. It's not for the profits. The profits follow, and if we have remembered that, they have never failed to appear. So thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. If there are any. Oh, there we go. How do um, HMOs or um, Medicare, or how do these groups actually decide um, what they're going to pay for? That's also a long answer. Um, so the decisions around negotiated prices have multiple steps. So there's been a lot of press recently about the role of pharmacy benefits managers how at times they've talked about wanting to have lower prices, but at the same time they're telling manufacturers they want a high list price so they can keep a proportion of the negotiated discount or rebate. So there are middlemen here at play, and so it's, it's kind of a confusing framework. Um, but essentially, there is a list price, and based on the leverage of any given payer with a particular clinical situation, so if you've got a prevalent condition with a lot of competitive agents in it, it's easier to negotiate a discount than if you've got a rare condition where this is the first new intervention, for example. Um, they will negotiate a series of discounts and or rebates. There may be agreements to guarantee a certain volume to the manufacturer so that they're generating a certain amount of income from that agreement. Um, there may be concessions made at various steps during the process. Manufacturers also do provide assistance to patients in the form of co-payment coupons and other things which, which factor in as well. So it's, it's a very confusing process. And so what we're trying to say with our reports is here's what we think the price, the fair price should be, however it's arrived at. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that was terrific, thank you, Dan. So, so allow me a cynical question. You seem to be implying that the Regeneron CEO is doing the right thing for altruistic reasons. But I, I keep finding myself in uh, arguments with some of our board members who insist that the CEOs of companies only act in order to maximize their profit. So, so can you just guide us through that? Like why? I mean, you said it's the same company. So it's is it just company. the same company that, that's like a, an unusual person in charge? Or are they? So do they, have they figured out the market in a way they're going to maximize their profit? I'm just curious. I would, I would characterize him as a, he's an unusual character for sure. Um, I don't think this is purely altruistic. Uh, so with dupilumab, the atopic dermatitis drug, what I didn't say is that it's also undergoing FDA review right now for severe asthma. So, um, so they're going to make money. <laughs> There's no question about that. I think what he's realizing is that this is the reality. He's, he's been on stage with other CEOs and told them that they are hiding behind not only high launch prices, but excessive price increases year over year, quarter over quarter, what have you, to mask the fact that they really don't have an R&D pipeline. So he's gone toe to toe with the CEO of Pfizer, for example, on those issues. So I do think he's a bit of a maverick. The question is going to be whether there are other companies who start to follow suit in some way, shape, or form. 
Um, the irony for me is that before coming to ICER, I was a research consultant to the life sciences industry for 15 years, working with clients, pharmaceutical clients, who were banging their heads against a wall trying to get payers to think about cost effectiveness for decision making. Now the rhetoric has shifted. They don't want to talk about cost effectiveness for decision making anymore, or they want to try to modify how it's approached. So, uh, so I, I think you're right to be cynical in a number of ways, but we at least see glimmers of hope. And we feel like if somebody decides to follow suit uh, for these two examples, then maybe we'll see sort of an industry st a trend start to occur. Has there been much um, discussion of cost effectiveness analysis for public health interventions and programs and using that analysis to justify sustainable reimbursement for these programs? Um, I don't think there's been nearly enough, um, but that's certainly a component of, uh, of evaluation that would be quite useful. Um, in fact, because you've got public health programs that may be on the ground already that already have a track record for how effective they might be, um, it's a pretty straightforward analysis to conduct. So I had a question of whether ICER ever um, redoes or does a second evaluation, because I'm thinking when you're evaluating these new medications, the type of patients that are in the trials aren't necessarily representative of the patients who ultimately take the drugs. And we've done some work that's shown that 20% of new drugs ultimately get new black box warnings or are withdrawn from the market. So the concerns often don't arise until some time has passed. Right. So um, we're planning to, in fact, we've actually rolled out a couple of updates already. So we, we did a review of the biologics for psoriasis in 2016. We're doing an update of that uh, this coming summer. And um, we've also, we're going to include uh, dupilumab in our asthma update that's happening in the fall as well. So uh, it's important for a number of reasons. One of those is safety signals that might not have been apparent at the time, um, use in real world data sets where um, anything from adherence to clinical benefit might be very different than what's experienced in clinical trials and in fact, higher prices, price increases. Um, I wanted to just add a comment first about uh, Jeremy Bentham, who, whose body is on display at University College London, and they take, but it's a headless body, and they take his head out once a year, and they preserved his head in a safe. So it's really quite an interesting <laughs> story that I think follows on your talk quite well. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> something to look into. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm wondering if you can help me understand how or why the cost of producing a medication, the R&D, and then the maintenance cost of you know how much it costs to produce and sell that medication is isn't a part of the discuss doesn't seem to be a part of the discussion at all. And if uh, if there's a really high if they if a company wants to sell at a really high price then I can imagine this would bring the price, the what you're talking about, value-based pricing, would bring the price down. But what if you have a substance that's incredibly cheap and has been out there for a long time, like naloxone, which ranges in price from about $30 a dose to $3,000 a dose. And um, it does something amazing. It saves a life, so that's huge value. But, but why should we pay up to a very high value when the cost of producing something might be cheap. I'm not sure if the, my question makes no, no, sense. No, no, your question makes a lot of sense, and um, I don't have an answer for you, um, because it's certainly been the case that when a high-cost intervention that may be questionable, either from a clinical benefit perspective or from a cost-effectiveness perspective, is, is introduced, questions are raised about whether the, the manufacturing costs and the development costs associated with those products really justify the price. So the hepatitis C drugs, for example, I think costs somewhere between, I forgot the exact number, 50 to $75 per pill to produce. Um, but it was at the time $84,000 for a course of treatment. So um, this is not the kind of data that is typically hidden in other industries, that the price bears a lot of a strong relationship to the cost of production. Um, 
It's just not been the case here because pricing has basically been around what the market will bear. And for a very long time, the market would bear a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I was very pleased at the beginning of your great talk that you talked about information asymmetry. And I think the medical field really characterizes that far more than any other area, that there is an, an alliance between the prescriber, the manufacturer, the pharmacist, to retain information and not to share it. And it really comes to the second point that you mentioned briefly, the issue of transparency. And there is information available internationally. There is available information from other HTA groups that are producing summaries of evidence and that. And yet I don't see that data circulating in discussions at all. I see everything as uniquely American and the belief structure that, for example, generic uptake in the US is very good, very high, 80, 85, 89 percent. Right. But what people don't often realize is that those generic medicines are very high priced yeah. by international standards, five to ten times internationals as a common situation. So right. I wondered if you can talk about the role your organization, mm -hmm. your regional seminars or meetings is obviously one step in the direction of publicizing this information. But I just wonder how much further you can go and working with other partners around the transparency of the data and the underlying information that already exists but is right. not shared. Right, and we also recognize that the bulk of our work has been around launch pricing without necessarily a focus on those price increases over time and we're, we're developing a method by which we can call out some of those excessive price increases that could be for both generics and branded agents. Um, but I think, like any organization, everything is a question of bandwidth and money. So um, we would hope to do more in this realm to try to, to get the conversation and get the transparency um, more widespread around how pricing occurs um, and some of the pricing decisions that are made. So you mentioned some of the political challenges that Medicare faced in trying to implement some of these like health technology assessment um, with the argument that they don't want to ration care. But when you really look at the healthcare system in the US, we are rationing care in an argue, arguably a pretty inefficient way. So why do you think that's some of the reasoning that has been used to try and not really implement a lot of this? Well, honestly, it's a, it's a widely held myth. So Americans feel that they should have choice. They shouldn't have their choices constricted in any way, shape, or form. You're right, those choices are constricted, but most consumers are removed from how constricted they are or the method by which they are. Last, last question, I think. I was very much intrigued by the comment about funding and how your organization is funded. And I was wondering if you could comment a bit, little bit about now thinking beyond the five years. I heard that you have support for the next five years, but what comes next? Are there some payers that are particularly interested to uh, support you? What could there be a model that is maybe even broader than the state here in Massachusetts? What, are there payers getting together and saying this is, this is so valuable because they are the consumers, part, uh, part of the consumer groups that read your right. reports. Right. Is there not a um, kind of movement of the payers at least to say these are types of organizations that we would like to support? So we've consciously stayed away from that kind of an arrangement. I think if a group of large payers would be willing to fund us forevermore tomorrow. The problem is that we're trying to convene all stakeholders, <clears throat> produce our documents in a publicly available and transparent way. And as soon as we start to work directly with any stakeholder or group of stakeholders on a particular topic, we're going to be seen as a tool of that stakeholder. So we'll be seen by uh, other stakeholders as a tool of payers to say no. If we were working for specific manufacturers to evaluate their drugs, we'd be seen as 
being overly favorable. So we're trying to negotiate a middle ground, recognizing that limits our funding choices. Thank you, everyone. There's a reception in the back room. We can now ask them questions informally. Ah, great.